You've opened a brand new bar in Brunswick East. I'd love to know a little bit about the concept. Tell us about what the venue is, who you're targeting, and how the venue stands out in the area. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Maggie Snacks and Liquor, basically I see it as like a neighborhood bar, just somewhere that's really kind of, you know, comfortable, inviting. Um, that's kind of where the name comes from. You know, Maggie's, it's like, you know, yeah, we're off to Maggie's place. But focusing on pretty much everything, doing everything well, which is something I don't see too often in hospital these days. Everyone's got their certain thing, whether it be like a wine bar or a cocktail bar or a beer bar, but not many places do all of it, like on the same level. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing here. So, look, we are focusing a touch more on the cocktails because that's just what this kind of area kind of needed, I think, because we've got a few great wine bars around here, like, you know, Old Palm Liquor and Wax Flower. Um, but there wasn't really a place that, to go to get, like, you know, really well thought out, well-made cocktails. So that's kind of our angle that we're slightly leaning towards. But we also have a great wine offering, great local craft beer. There's a big focus on like locality and seasonality for both bar and kitchen. My business partner, Scott Blomfield, he's a Kiwi. And so for his for his menu, he decided to kind of make it a bit nostalgic and bring back a few little New Zealand treats, kind of old dishes, things that he grew up on, but kind of like rework them and elevate them, that sort of thing. So a lot of the, the menu is based around that sort of stuff. But it's also just great, great bar food, like a lot of, like the name suggests, like a lot of great little snacks, things that you can just eat with one hand, things that go great with, with alcohol. With the bar, um, I'm very much in the mindset that there's a lot of great booze in this country. So I've kept pretty much 99% of the um, offering as Australian. So like pretty much everything, all the spirits on my back bar, excluding the agaves, are Aussie. Um, all my beers are Aussie a large portion of the the wine list is Aussie like probably a good 80 percent um and all from like kind of local small producers I love selling things that kind of have a story to it because I think it makes us a bit more proud to sell it and helps us kind of convey that story to the guests so like a lot of producers that we you know might be you know Camille and Mark Ward from Winding Road Distillery and you know how they've like hand sold their their rum to me and and like we like what they do the good you know, make good people that make good um, good product. So that's kind of an example of kind of what I'm trying to trying to offer here. Alejandro, you've got a drink called Margot Robbie. There's been a fair bit of chat about this particular drink because it doesn't use the gin that Margot Robbie owns. I'd love to know your comments on this. It, it got a, a, not heated, but there's a conversation going online at the moment. So tell me a bit about this drink. Uh, the drink's going to haunt me to the end of my days, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, look, that was just like a fun drink. It's kind of based on a pistachio sale that I made at a previous venue. Um, I just kind of sort of bumped it up with the Ruby Mistel. Anyway, the name came about at a little tasting at my place. And when I made it, everyone was, was like, oh, it's pink and fluffy. You know, we, we love it. And my partner thought, oh, it's like Margot Robbie. You know, because at the time, her, you know, movie the Barbie was, was showing. And I was, I was kind of like, that's actually pretty, pretty apt. That'll, that'll work work for this drink and yeah you know it's pink it's fluffy everyone loves it much like its namesake it's the Margot Robbie you're an incredibly creative guy obviously you play guitar you're you're a successful bartender you've got your own venue now I understand that you even wanted to be a a tattoo artist tell me tell me about how you apply this sort of creativity in your work kind of like working within within certain limits I think limiting yourself is the best way to be creative because when you don't have limits you don't know where to start and you kind of go off in weird places. Um, so I guess for me, you know, using seasonal produce is a, is a good one where I'm like, cool, what's in season this month or, you know, the next few months. And I'll look at some like little maps and seasonal produce charts and be like, cool, cool, cool. I want to play with that. And then I'll kind of either from my own knowledge or going back to reference books that I have, kind of find cool flavor pairings and how they might work. And I like to do things that are a little bit left to center that aren't, you know, too obvious. Like, you know, for example, I'm not going to put a watermelon mint drink in the menu because yes, it works. Yes, it's delicious, but it's kind of been, you know, done. I like to do things that kind of work a little bit outside of the box that people might not have heard of or people might look at and be like, that's kind of weird. I wonder what that's going to taste like. But then ultimately it's delicious. Mm. It's always 
about creating something that's delicious, but in kind of a weird, weird way. Using like things like fermentation, um, to like transform stuff into something completely different altogether. So what, you know, a flavor you might think something tastes like, you, tra you ferment it and all of a sudden it's like, takes on something completely different. And then you're like, wow, that's awesome. That reminds me of this is this. It's interesting hearing in your answer there about limiting those boundaries on, on, on what's possible to kind of harness that creativity or direct that creativity. Can you describe that a little bit more around how you apply that generally in other creative pursuits? Like I mentioned, like when you don't have limits, it kind of, you've got no direction. You know, you don't have a clear vision of where you're going to go. You're just kind of like a bit lost in the surrounds of everything. When you do have limits, it kind of gives you something to focus on. It gives you an angle. Like it's kind of like that good challenge. So it's a good challenge to be like, okay, I've really got this thing to work with. I need to achieve this certain thing. It gives you something to work towards. Alejandro, you've been on opening bar teams before. You know the sort of chaos that comes with opening new venues. Tell me about something that's come up as, as a challenge in the process that you just could not have possibly foreseen. Mate, many, many, many things. So this has obviously been very different because it's my own. Um, it's my own money invested into it and all that. I think, that, I think some of the challenges, like obviously m money was a big one. Like we only had so much and the space we've taken on turned out to be a lot more work than we originally intended. We thought it was just going to be a bit of a, a refurb, you know, look at paint, bit of this, bit of that. Turned out to, we had to like gut the whole place and there was so many things wrong with it. Um, being an old building, there were so many things wrong that ended up costing us more time, more money. Um, working directly with people like architects, which didn't quite work out for us. You know, architects, landlords, all that sort of stuff was stuff I hadn't thought about. What are some of those hurdles that you would advise other people who are opening their own venues that they can look out for? Um, make sure you have a lot of money. <laughs> like how much more are we talking? Like is it proportional to, to the piece? Are you talking like 10% extra or to talk us through this? Yeah. Oh, look, it's probably always going to be about another, you know, 25% extra at least. Another thing that I didn't really bargain on is having to learn a lot more new things that I wasn't expecting to, like basically becoming a tradie sort of almost um, in order to save save money. Like me and like my um, Scotty, my business partner, me and him had to do so many like labor jobs, you know, picking up sand, gravel, digging that up, pulling up the, the backyard, um, learning how to level it, all, the, all these sort of things I never thought I had to do. But man, was I happy to finally be done with that and get back to what I actually enjoy doing and I'm actually good at. <laughs> As an operator, there are typically these little things that you like to focus a lot of attention on that customers will just oversee. Talk me through some of these little things that you just, you think are incredibly important that maybe might even be underrated. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's all the tiny details of like, just the whole ambiance of the place, you know, lightings, music, that sort of stuff. Like it's something that I'm constantly during shift. I'm constantly monitoring, you know, turning down the lights, just, just that little bit. I'm like, is it dark and sexy? Is it, you know, bright and sunny? Like what's, what's the mood? What's the vibe? Uh, music, music is another one that I'm constantly working on, like moving around to different rooms. Who's there? What are they doing? What's the levels like? That sort of stuff. Um, another one, hooks. hooks. Something we've, absolutely focused on heaps here at Maggie's, which I'm pretty, pretty proud about is there are hooks everywhere. You know, there's n nothing like one of my pet peeves is when people, you know, they sit at the table and they just dump all their fucking belongings in the middle of the table. And you're like, where are we supposed to put stuff? I'm like I walk up to the table with three plates and I'm like, okay, where am I putting this guys? Where am I? What, what do you expect me to do here? You know, it's all this shit's just on the table. So I love telling people there are hooks everywhere. You know, feel free to hang your stuff. You know, there's no reason to have it in the middle of the table. Especially in Melbourne as well. It's, uh, it's warmer at the moment, but when it's cold, yeah. people can have coats. Exactly. And I think it's a nice, nice thing for them. They're like, oh, I don't have to, you know, throw my 
jacket on the back of my seat or on the ground like you actually hook it up um that's the thing that i'm pretty pretty stoked about for this place 